This is a segment from The Annex, an academic sociology-themed podcast. For more, visit us on the web at theannexpodcast.com. And now we turn to Daniel Lorison of Swarthmore College. Daniel recently came out with a new book, The Class Ceiling, Why It Pays to Be Privileged with Policy Press. The book looks at social class and opportunity and the barriers facing the upwardly mobile. Uh, he also has a great Twitter feed. Daniel, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, Daniel underscore Lorison, I think. <laughs> um, Worth a follow. Okay. And- in yeah. any case, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Sure. Happy to be here. It is Daniel underscore Larison. Yes. <laughs> right, and now let, wait, let's start by talking about the class ceiling. What's the book about? Whom did you study? What did you find? Yeah, so the book is about overall uh, finding um, that we found in a couple of different data sets in the UK that there's a class origin pay gap that is sort of similar in size um, and similar in persistence to, you know, sort of net of controls to other f- stuff other folks have found that are, you know, gender get pay gaps or uh, racial ethnic pay gaps. So working class origin people in elite or top jobs in the UK are earning about um, 16 or, or the privileged origin people are earning about 16% more than the working class origin people in that same broad category of jobs. So that's hmm. sort of the, the key sort of statistical finding. And then um, the so the first half of the book sort of lays that out. And then the second half of the book um, is a series of case studies um, and interviews with people in four uh, fields that we count as sort of part of these top or elite jobs um, about their career trajectories and their um, their experiences and sort of looking at why you see a class ceiling or a class pay gap in top jobs. So wait, when you talk about the class ceiling, are we talking or about closure at the top? Let's mm-hmm. say, are you talking about the top 0.1%, the top 1%, 5%, 15%? Like, where are you talking about? Yeah, so we're we our top is occupational. Um, I could I could do a very long uh, discussion of all the ways sociologists versus economists versus everybody else measure class. And part of what we're actually doing in the book is sort of making a case for you need multiple measures of class position. But for the top, what we're looking at is people in. Um, what uh, in the UK is called the National Statistics Socioeconomic Classification, and they all go around saying NSEC all the time as if it's a totally transparent term. Um, but it's the, you know, it's it's basically the EGP, the Erickson Goldthorpe Porter Carrero scheme. So the top uh, group is people in professional or managerial, um, sort of higher professional or managerial jobs. And then we also include some uh, people in in sort of the creative industries. So people who work in acting, in journalism, in film and TV, that sort of thing. So it'd be parent, but it'd be like what we'd consider the American equivalent of like the upper middle class. Yeah, something like that. And it's about um, 17 or so percent of the workforce in the UK. And, and then concretely, how does class advantage people? Like, what are the specific mechanisms by which uh, somebody from the upper middle class or higher can get an edge on those who were born into families further down the scale? Yeah, so so part of it, I mean, first, just thinking about the sort of quantitative results broadly, part of it is where in those top jobs people are, right? So people from working class backgrounds are more likely to be heads of, you know, smaller companies that they might have worked their way up through um, than they are to be, um, you know, in, uh, you know, sort of at an elite an accountancy firm, for example. Um, so part of it is where in those fields people are, and it's a lot of sort of sorting. So we're not actually comparing, you know, a working class origin person who's a professor to another working class origin who's person who's also a professor in in some of this sort of broad analysis. Um, uh, but then the the things that advantage privileged origin people, um, I, was, I, I, I kind of wanted us to have a, a more creative way of doing it, but it really came down to sort of the, the three Borgesian capitals. You know, there's economic capital um, that, you know, people from privileged origins have parents who are supporting them well into their sort of work lives um, in mm-hmm. terms of helping with down payments on houses or paying for a flat in London, mm-hmm. um, in terms of, you know, sort of topping up their bank account when they're doing an internship that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's sort of the 
sponsorship that we see uh, where people who are in senior positions in the firms that we're looking at sort of uh, pick people they they like who are often people who are already like them and from privileged mm -hmm. backgrounds and help them along. Um, and then there's a lot of just sort of norms and codes about, you know, how you act and, and what looks like a successful person in this field um, that end up privileging people from privileged backgrounds. Can, can you say a bit on the idea? See, uh, you, in your book, you directly engaged an ill-conceived belief that I harbored that uh, one of the big benefits was was just confidence, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, uh, you, you pushed back on that. Uh, you had some qualifications. You want to uh, just sort of lay them out? Sure. So, I mean, one of the at the end of each of our interviews, uh, we ask people, "What is you know, what what do you think is going on?" We see this overall um, class origin pay gap. Why? What do you think explains that? And confidence was what a lot of people said. Um, mm -hmm. But when you sort of poke at confidence, what you realize is like different people are confident in different settings, right? It's very easy for me to be confident in a college classroom because I'm in a college classroom all the time, and I know what's expected there, and I know I'm in charge, and you know that's an easy place for me to be confident. Um, it's would be much harder for me to be confident in, a, you know, a schmoozy function uh, if I happened to have the problem of having a banker for a partner and I had to go to her bank functions, right? Mm -hmm. um, that that's not a co an environment I'm used to. That's not an environment I'm comfortable in, um, and I would not um, be able. To I would pro I would feel less confident in that situation. So it's not about my sort of intrinsic confidence levels. It's about, you know, people feel confident in situations that they understand um, and where people are treating them with respect and where they feel comfortable. I love the uh, the argument that you were advancing. I mean, there there is no way I could have been a professor without, you know, uh, the support that I got. Like I look at my students at CUNY, what they have to do. And I'm like, you know, there, I, I could never thrive as well as I did under their circumstances. Like all I had to do was be good at school and get high profile stuff and everything else was taken care of. But like, I, I also, I know a lot of people who came from solid backgrounds that flamed out, you know, uh, they lacked the self-discipline or the charisma or they weren't good looking or something, you know? Right. right. Uh, so in and of itself, like how powerful are these advantages that are conferred by class? Like, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think we we are careful in the book because I think it, you know, it's the case that we want to make, and the case that I think is true is not, you know, people are successful only because they come from privileged backgrounds, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to we sort of return throughout the book to this guy Mark, who was like unusually he's from a privileged background. He was unusually sort of reflective about his trajectory. And, you know, he just, he sort of took us through. He said, I could take you through my whole career in sponsors. Um, and he took us through sort of all the advantages that he had. But at a certain point, he said, you know, it's not like I think I'm rubbish. Um, I see lots of people who had the same advantages that I do who have flamed out just as you said. Um, mm -hmm. So the argument isn't privilege guarantees success, right? It's just that, um, you know, privileged origins facilitate success. They make it easier. I think the, the you know, the counterpoint isn't, um, or the, you know, the sort of, the, the counterfactual of some privileged people flame out, absolutely. The counterfactual that's important is, or the sort of thing to think about that's important is the working class people who might be just as, have just as much intrinsic talent, be just as willing to work hard, um, but because, you know, they don't have the financial support that allows them to be in a contingent position. Uh, economic position or a, you know, a temporary job or that sort of thing for, for years and years until they land the permanent thing, they move into something else much sooner than somebody who's privileged would. Oh yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'm so happy that Daniel's on this episode because uh, Sam actually had come to uh, UC, uh, UC Irvine to present right. uh, the paper, uh, the project, the book at the uh, business school and everybody loved it and everybody was very, you know, kind of interested in it. And this is kind of how, you know why it's so special to have Dan to be on when Daniel's on because I can actually uh, talk to Daniel about it now. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I find to be really fascinating and great about this book is that you have this sort of marrying of a really strong quantitative base and a really strong qualitative base. You know that you have this sort of doing the mixed methods sort of approach really well by having two 
you know, kick-ass scholars in both respects who specialize in their respective, you know, quantitative and qualitative. Uh, I was kind of curious about the process of putting together a, you know, a book, a research project where you have uh, these two kind of aspects married together mm-hmm. and, you know, kind of the process that you went through with that and some of maybe the pitfalls mm-hmm. of uh, doing a project of this type, because I think this sort of co-authorship is really great. And I, I would love to see, you know, more people do it. I would love to do something like this. Mm-hmm. Good question. Yeah. Um, so Sam and I uh, started this project. Um, this We talk about this a little bit in the book, but we started this project uh, because he had written a paper with a different co-author uh, that was sort of trying to tell a story from um, some data from the Great British Class Survey, which is the um, this sort of research project we were both part of when I first got to the UK um, and had just, you know, not been able to pull it off. Um, and got really nasty reviews um, and was basically going to give up on the project. And we sort of looked at it together and saw this, um, one of the things that they found in that paper was this class origin pay gap in that data. Um, And so when, you know, and then we sort of really quickly wrote a brand new paper um, to submit to the special issue and then sort of kept kept working from there because it seemed like a really interesting finding. Um, So all of the, you know, the whole time the project has been very collaborative between the two of us and we've sort of talked over the ideas and we've talked over what we need to do next. Um, But then, you know, the actual interviewing and case studies, Sam did that um, with some other folks and, you know, we, we had the conversations that went into the, um, the research design, but the, the actual on the ground work was him and it's always me uh, instead data um, with, you know, laboring over, you know, how do I pool this data and how do I think, you know, how do I think about these things? Um, And then we each, you know, for the book, we each wrote the sort of chapters based on the the data that we generated, but then passed them back and forth lots of times and fought over everything from, you know, the big ideas to the commas. Right. Um, to, to get a book that I think, I hope, reads with a sort of unified voice from the two of mm-hmm. us. One of the things that, that I was kind of curious about, I mean, looking, you know, you as a quantitative scholar, looking at qualitative research from this sort of opposite perspective, I mean, is is there kind of, were there interesting insights that came about, you know, you, you know each of you kind of looking at the you know, quantitative or qualitative data from a different, you know, methodological perspective or, you know, kind of taking it with a different sort of lens. I mean, is there... Yeah, I mean, it's hard to separate for me the the sort of personality and style differences from the methodological differences. I mean, Sam's done some quantitative work in his dissertation and I did actually mostly qualitative stuff for my dissertation. Um, so we're not either of us, you know, entirely in one side of the discipline or the other, mm-hmm. although we do, um, speci- certainly for this project, that was the... Di- the division. So I think the, you know, the, a lot of the sort of productive disagreements between us had to do with like Sam is a person who wants to tell a story. He wants to tell yeah. a story that is clear and makes sense and doesn't have extraneous information and is compelling and is emotionally engaging and all of that, um, which is, you know, our qualities that you tend to associate more with the qualitative researchers, I think. And I'm a person who wants to get the details right and be precise and be clear. <laughs> and I don't mind having like seven subordinate clauses in a sentence if I think they're necessary to be yeah. sufficiently precise and clear. Um, and so, you know, we had a lot of back and forth about how much, uh, you know, sort of clarity versus story. And what you want is the, is both of those as much as possible. Um, but that was that was where a lot of the sort of um, difference in our styles or approaches came through is in in um, back and forth about, you know, how much is the story important? Does this or not how much is it important, but sort of what should we be emphasizing here? How many details do we need? That sort of thing. Yeah, and I think I think one of the things that's just really rad about the the book is that you know you f- y'all focus on a particular sort of research question, but a lot of the findings that you you come across have wide application in a lot of different you know people you know what people are interested in. Like as somebody that you know predominantly studies uh, careers in entertainment and in cultural production, I mean the findings about you know, parental subsidy in order to kind of pursue an acting career or the ways in which you kind of work your way through the television network in order to make it into the upper ranks of, of programming. I, I mean, that, that had, I was really drawn to that. And the thing that's kind of cool about it from the stuff that, that I've, I've read is that it has that sort of wide application to a large number of 
different sort of what what people are interested in. I think that's one of the things that's really neat about this project is that it, it, it's got a little something for for everyone. I think that that's really the kind of neat thing about it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's um... – you know, the specifics of, you know, working class origin people versus privileged origin people in a few top firms in the UK and you know, the field of acting and then three firms in the UK, um, like that's a small slice of the world. But I think what we're able to get at pretty well is the the sort of dynamics of, of advancement in these four fields that probably look something like the dynamics of sort of careers and advancements in other areas as well. Um, and the ways that a lot of, I mean, I think for me, one of the big points of the book is a lot of what gets taken as merit or what, you know, turns out to be success is in some way about cultural matching, about homophily, about, you know, about having external resources, about um, a lot of sort of, you know, contingent uh, and often class and race and gender linked things. So I teach at the City University of New York, I teach a lot of uh, working class and first generation students. I think I think we're more than half Pell Grant here. Right. Uh, but I run into some very, very smart, ambitious students who seem to have all the personal tools to be every bit as successful as, you know, the the gifted students I saw in elite colleges. Mm -hmm. What advice should I give them? What can I do to better mentor them to compensate for this class gap? Yeah, that's a great question. There's somebody on um, on Twitter, I think it was today, who responded to the um, – there was a piece where I was uh, interviewed in The Atlantic about the book. Um, and somebody responded and said, you know, this, this should just be rewritten as a self-help book for the, you know, for the underprivileged. I don't remember the words he used. And, and um, you know, the problem isn't that organizations need to change. It's just that people need to learn how to adapt to be like the people who are already there and successful. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, on the one hand – you know, one thing we found is that for an individual to be successful, there, you know, there does often have to be some adapting to the norms and sort of codes of the culture that they're in. Um, I think that's, you know, some of that at least is a problem, right? There's sort of, you know, we can think about like how many of the norms of academia are just sort of dominant culture, white and middle or upper class norms, and how many of them are actually functional for academia. Certainly not all of them. Um, and you can think about that for the other the other firms as well. But if you want, if you as an individual want to be successful in those places, you have to, I think, on some level realize that their cultures are different and you may have to figure out how you want to navigate that. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's not untrue that in order for folks to navigate these spaces, they have to figure out how you. They have they have to learn the, the rules to some extent, mm -hmm. um, but I also think and we say this in the book, um, and I you know I say it every time I get a chance that you know the better question or the more important question is for these sorts of organizations to think about what can we do to be a place that is more likely to facilitate people from a wide variety of backgrounds feeling comfortable here and being successful here. So um, what is that? What do they have to do? Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, one of the, one of the things, and this is sort of a, there's a chicken and egg problem, but the more people from, you know, from the non-traditional backgrounds that you have, uh, whether that's along gender or race lines or along class lines, uh, the more successful it is likely that all of those people will be able to be, um, you know, and the more the I think the other the other sort of more programmatic thing people could do or organizations could do is um, really look at what are the informal processes through which people get ahead. Right. So um, in the accountancy firm we looked at, there were, um, you know, there was a, a formal rule based path for sort of how what steps you had to take to become an accountant. Um, and then there was what actually happened, which was most of the time people who are already or to become a partner, not to become an accountant. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time, people who were already partners spotted somebody in the incoming, you know, accountant class among the, the new folks who they just thought was good. And they sort of took that person by the hand and helped them navigate the process and often sort of cleared opportunities for them to advance more quickly than the, the formal rules said they ought to, right? So if there's processes happening sort of under the... Um, under the radar of the formal rules, um, then that's going to advantage the people who know how to navigate that informal process.
For more, visit us on the web, theannexpodcast.com.